Hey, welcome back everyone. We're here to talk to you about how to make your documentary film. Today we're talking about production and this next set of content is all about production. So it's time to have some fun. This is what you've been working so hard for during pre-production and I'm really looking forward to getting into this. So. Oh no, it's going to be great. You're actually going to roll camera and look, you might have rolled camera already if you've done a bit of strategic shooting as part of your pre-production. But this stage, production, is where you really get into it, where you get out all of the shoots that you need to actually make your film. So it's pretty exciting. Okay, so sometimes what I find helpful is thinking about the ingredients of your production phase. And I think there are five or six sort of common ingredients to most documentary films. So you've got things like interviews, observational footage, sometimes called actuality. You've got B-roll. You've got specialty shoots, you've got archival materials, and for some films you have a significant enough component of animation uh, for them to warrant going into the production phase. During your pre-production phase, I am sure that you would have identified the key talent that you want to interview and hopefully you've already lined them up. So the next step is actually going and filming that interview. Okay, so I love interviews. I think they're absolutely foundational to most documentary films, but I hate talking head films, right? And I think they're different. The opportunity to get really great interviews, those moments that you could never script that make documentaries so brilliant, often come out of, you know, controlled interviews. So you're often going to shoot way more than you're going to need to use in your final film, but the bits of gold that you get from prospecting through your interviews will become the foundation of most of the films that you make. So when you're filming your interviews, there's a few things that you really want to take into consideration. So you would have already, you know, prepared all your gear and you've got all your sound yep. and all of those things, all those elements, you would have already done all of that in pre-production. But on the interview day, what are the key things you think are really important about actually just planning and turning up on production for an interview? Okay, so I think this is a whole series in and of itself about how to do a great interview. Maybe we should do that one day. But I think the absolutely key thing on interview days is um, to make your talent really comfortable. Most people are pretty nervous and a bit camera shy before they get um, on film. And if they're not, then they're probably too media trained and you're actually going to need to relax them to get really good conversational, spontaneous uh, remarks that are really helpful for your filmmaking. So I'd say that's the number one. And it goes right through to how your crew behave on set, how you yourself behave when you're bumping in and bumping out of the location, everything like that. So I think it's about being really organised, knowing exactly how much time you've got with your talent, making sure you can set up all your gear and equipment really efficiently making the best use of that time. So you're rolling camera with your talent, not having them sit around, wait for you to get ready. And just those key things will help make the interviewee much more comfortable as well. It's just the more organised and efficient that you are with, um, with actually managing the whole location and what you're doing. Yeah, so this is a super helpful ingredient, interviews, because you can sort of figure out what quantities of interviews your film's going to need. So you can look at who you pre-interview during your pre-production phase. You can figure out how many of those interviews are likely to make it into the final cut. You can figure out where they're located and how long each interview will take. And I would always say that, you know, normally interviews take about two hours once you do the bump in, interview, bump out, you know, so you might even be allocating half a day, depending on how quick you are um, on set for each of these interviews and there's gonna be travel time. All of that's really helpful because you know how many resources you're gonna need, how many crew hours you're gonna need across what period of time, and then you can start booking them in. The other part of this too is once you know who you're gonna be interviewing, be it a subject expert, be it a um, person telling a personal story, that also helps to inform what sort of observational footage you're gonna to need to capture to go with that because this comes back to the talking heads that you were saying before, you know, the more observational footage you capture, the less you have to rely on having someone as a talking head on screen because you can cut away to what it is that's related to the interview. Let's break this down because I think there's a similarity and a difference between B-roll um, or overlay footage and observational or actuality footage. So let's break it down. I think let's start with B-roll or overlay footage because I think you often will get this on the same day as you do your interview 
uh, material. So you might go and interview someone and then you might get some footage of them at work. It might be in a lab, it might be in a classroom, it might be in whatever location walking that relates to your story. <laughs> Lots of walking shots, they're very Getting common. Getting coffee, anything, yeah. anything that relates to what they do and what you're talking about Close is going to be incredibly yeah. helpful. Yeah, things that you know really demonstrate what they've talked about in the interview. So I think that's often helpful to do the interview first and then say, look, we've got this block of time that we've already agreed with you that we'll go and get more shots. And based on your interview, I think it would be great to get these five or six actions. And then you get that in the most dynamic way possible, often with moving camera shot. So um, I think that's where B-roll belongs. And I think we've checked B-roll off the list. However, I think it's a little different from observational documentary or actuality. And often you will do that on a different day because it's more technically complex. Mm -hmm. Do you want to take us through that side of things? That does need to allow for a lot more time on the production day because with actuality, observational, you really don't know exactly what's going to happen and what you're going to be filming. So you need to be able to be really flexible and you need to be able to um, structure it in a way that you're not really pressured for time and that you can actually um, really immerse in it on the day and perhaps you could talk through maybe a bit of the types of shots you might be trying to capture. Yeah so let's break down why it's more complicated as well. So compared to b-roll where you're sort of asking usually one or two people hey guys can you do this we'll shoot it and you know that that's going to go in as overlay to things that they've talked about so you can show don't tell. Observational documentary or actuality is different so let's Let's say you are making a film about education and how to get students to learn better. So you're wanting to actually observe teaching and learning happening and demonstrate to the audience through that action what good teaching looks like to drive learning outcomes, right? You're going to need to shoot this in a more complex way. You're going to be in a classroom, which is a less controlled environment. You're going to probably need multiple cameras because there's lots of people in the scene. You're going to need to have operated sound, like a boom sound and probably some other microphones bouncing around. So you need a sound recorder. And it's going to need to unfold over a period of time and a long enough period of time so that everyone in the scene forgets you're there as a film crew. So straight away, you've got a longer period of time. It's not going to be as quick to do. You've got more cameras, more crew, more people, more sound requirements, just to get those little moments of gold that actually demonstrate to the audience what we're talking about. And that's really powerful material to have in your film um, and absolutely dedicated resources to it, but it's hard to do it quickly and well. So I think that was a really good um, overview of what observational or actuality filming is. And we actually did another episode which we'll um, link to in the show notes which talked about B-roll and how you can actually capture B-roll. So we won't go over that in too much more detail. But moving on now, so we've covered interviews, we've covered observational documentary, we've covered B-roll, and maybe yeah. we should touch on specialty shoots. Specialty shoots. Yeah, yeah. so spe- what, do I, what are specialty shoots? So specialty shoots for me are things like specialty cameras that you can stick on cars or trains or outside vehicles and see someone drive around you know they're often like a GoPro or a little action cam type thing. A drone where you can get really great aerial footage would be another type of specialty camera for some settings underwater cameras depending on what your subject matter is etc. You know they're really quite specialized usually the person who's shooting these needs to have some specialist knowledge on how to actually capture footage in that way with those types of cameras and sometimes you can add them to your um, interview or b-roll shooting day we often do that with our drones and sometimes with our specialty cameras where we just stick them on a wheelchair or whatever and let someone go and it runs for five minutes and it's some great material because it's like really immersive yeah. you know point of view type material the drone stuff's great for getting establishing shots and really setting the scene so these are the specialty shots that you can weave into your call sheet or your production schedule for a particular day. Yeah, and you might even do some setup shots um, in a studio. So you might be wanting some, um, you know, things that create more interstitials to move between different parts of your documentary um, to make it more visually interesting and, you know, a visual representation of a different idea. That's very common in documentary just to you know, keep that audience interest, keep things, you know, moving along. Yeah, so um, in that example, you might need to set up a stage or hire a stage. So again, it's going to factor in to your production schedule, but also your budget, because that Mm -hmm. stuff costs money. So 
it's another ingredient. It's like a special ingredient, you know, that you kind of chuck on to season it that might be really helpful. It's going to cost a lot. It's going to take some time. So it's good that you have it in mind at this early stage of your production phase. So moving on, next stage, archival material. This is a specialist area for you, Sue. So tell us about how you go about sourcing archival material for documentary films. Look, there are a few different types of archival materials that you can get. So, for example, if you're filming someone's personal story and it's a retrospective story, you might want to ask them for photos or um, you know, phone footage that they might have taken that will really help bring their story to life. And so that's a type of archival material and you need to create that by asking the person firstly when you're interviewing them if they have any photos or things they can share with you that you could use in your project. And then you need to make sure that, you know, obviously you take good care of those photos. If they're digital, it's a lot easier. But often people will give you, um, you know, printouts or really old photographs from, you know, 1960 or whatever. And you need to probably recreate that photo by taking a high resolution photo of the photo that you can then put into your documentary to, to help with those kinds of quality issues that you can encounter. So there's quite a bit to that archival process. And the other part of archi archival is obviously if you're getting footage from footage libraries and stock footage libraries. And that's something that can also happen in post-production. But during production, it's much more about making sure you're gathering the archival materials from your interviewees so that you don't miss that opportunity to get it right there and then when it's fresh in their minds. Yeah, it is so good to ask on interview day for those materials because they'll it'll start the process and sometimes people find it. It can take and, ages. Yeah. And even though some of this stuff's really amateur, you know, in terms of the quality of it, the moments captured, you, you can't get yourself because they've already happened and they're so good for you, the story that you're telling. I had a couple of questions about the library resources. So mm -hmm. I guess, you know, there are lots of different libraries where people can gather materials for their films from the broadcasters to stock footage libraries, TV stations and elsewhere. So how do you, you know, how do you go about that and how much does it cost? Oh, look, the cost can vary so dramatically depending on where you're getting your footage from. Often um, footage libraries through television stations, for example, they'll have a cost per second with a minimum of 30 seconds and you, then you also have to pay a librarian to go and research and find the footage and then they send you clips and then you have to choose from the clips and you choose your in and out codes and it's actually quite a long lengthy and often very expensive process so it really depends on the topic of your film and what sort of archival material you need. But then there's also all the you know hundreds of stock footage libraries online that you can access you know through Adobe Stock through to Shutterstock. There's so many of them and they all have very different pricing and rates and different types of footage. So it's so dependent on the topic of your film, how you go about sourcing that. Yeah, so archival materials have blown my budgets many times over the years um, because they're much more expensive than I've anticipated. So I think it's really good for you to have it in mind at this point in time, just about how much screen time that you want to you know, get out of your archive because just the cost of getting really high quality duplication is often a big part of it, let alone the researcher yeah. going and finding what you want. And then the license fees can be exorbitant. So particularly when you're trying to release it in cinema, because often they have these tiered pricing structures which is like you know to put on YouTube costs this much to put it on cinema costs 10 times that much you know so I think these are things that you really need to have in mind at this early yeah, stage of production. Yeah and I mean for example one of our recent films Conquering Cancer we really wanted a shot of an octopus eating a crab because it was a fantastic <laughs> metaphor for this particular film that we were making it was very important it was really hard to find it's really hard to find I think there's like two images in the whole world of an octopus eating a crab and we got one of them and you know we just had to pay the fee they were asking for because it's not like you can go out and get a water filmer <laughs> and get that shot anytime you want yeah. so again it just depends on your budget and who you know what you need and how you're going to access it and for the lucky last ingredient which won't apply to all of the films that you guys are making but will apply to some is animation so for documentary films that really rely on animation particularly animation to recreate key moments in time so you may not want to go and do filmed recreations for whatever reason that's fine but you need to have a whole sequence play out on screen that relies on animation this is a common storytelling technique 
I think if you're animating like that in your film, you need to start thinking about that process during production because it's going to take so long to get through it. It's going to totally blow your post-production time frame if you don't start it until post. So we've covered a lot, five key ingredients plus animation that you might be doing during your production phase. So hopefully that's been really helpful and don't hesitate to go back over the past episodes in pre-production if you want to dive a bit more into detail on any of those types of shoots. So next week we are going to be back and we're going to be talking about how you're going to tell your story because that's really going to impact the way you go about capturing your film in the production phase. See you next week.